We are live in the HP studio for another episode of uh, the Reinvent the Classroom podcast. We've got HP, obviously, uh, big supporters of this. We've got Intel. Rob, is your uh, HyperX microphone uh, ready to go? Super ready. Hasn't been more ready. And we have today with us... Kelly Hollis, a live in person. Kelly, is your HyperX microphone there? It is. Go? It's very impressive. I'm it's very excited. It's fancy, <laughs> isn't it? It's, it's good stuff. Uh, look, this is going to be a great episode. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things. Obviously, you work for Education Perfect nowadays? That's correct, yes. A uh, science teacher by trade? I am, yes. So Unfortunately, <laughs> high school teacher, right? Uh, yes, oh, 13 yeah, and a well, half years of yeah. science well, teaching. You know, One of the good ones. Primary school te- <laughs> the best teachers are primary school teachers, right? So I've been told. Yeah, but... and, and you know what? You know who the best high school teachers are? No. Former primary school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, great to have you here and, and let's dive in and, and, and have the chat. Sounds good to me. Look, uh, so good. <laughs> so exciting to have you here, Kelly. And obviously, Rob, uh, before we even dive into to talking about uh, why you're here and the, your, your science experience and what's happening, I wonder if we should say, the, tell the, the, the listeners... Uh, our origin story of our friendship. Is that worth diving into right at the get-go? I think so, because it really was a pivotal moment in my career as an educator. Yeah, mine too. It's almost the anniversary right now, right? It is almost our nine-year anniversary, yes. All right, why don't you retell that that magical day? I I, I think storms had been brewing (laughs) for about six months. uh, There was a a break in the clouds. Uh, Rainbows had appeared. Uh, the world stopped moving, and then the three of us came together at one moment. Is, is that how you recall it? Oh, 100%. Something like that. Yeah, 100% word for word. Um, so, yeah, we were all at a teach meet at Google for the first teach meet that I'd ever presented at, and I was pretty nervous about that first experience, but you were there presenting. Rob, did I you present I was coming up from Newcastle, day? just wanted to meet some teachers who yeah. are of like mind. Yeah. Yep. And then afterwards, a few of us said, well, why don't we go grab dinner? So we went and grabbed dinner and the rest is literally history. The last nine years, we've done some amazing things as a group and as individuals. And I really do put a lot of what I've done in my education career down to that night. Yeah, what, what about we're a little bit like the the educational Wu Tang Clan, like you know the the Wu Tang Clan. They, they they come together, they collaborate, they do things, but they also uh, have the the individual uh, aspects to, to to go off and 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 have their solo career and and do their thing, but they come back together. We're a little bit like that. A little bit, yeah. You yeah. can definitely use that analogy. It's a good one. There you go, the Wu- Aussie Ed Wu Tang Clan. That's us. <laughs> But look, it's, it's, it's great. To, it's great. To, uh, so good to, to have you here. Um, let's unpack your your career. Like, obviously, um, a teacher. We're, we're here on an education podcast. Um, but you've had a little bit of a an unusual shift and, and, and change. Let's unpack. Um, where did you go to university? How did the career unfold? And how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, well, um, going to school, all through my schooling, I was really involved with a lot of extracurricular things. So I loved getting involved in anything that I could. And in particular, Rocker Stedford was one of the big ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Spent many, many, many hours working on Rocker Stedford as a student. And then after I finished school, I started going back. And that was really where I developed the real passion to want to work with students going forward. Um, While I was at school, I was sort of persuaded to try something different by my teachers. So, Competitive um, cheer? uh, No, competitive cheer cheer didn't come along until quite a long time after I finished school. Jumping the gun, jumping the gun. You are, you are. But um, I had a love of the X-Files at (gasps) school, so I really was interested in forensic science. So that was the first thing I did at university. If I recall, Scully was your hero? Uh, Yes. Scully yeah. was my Dana hero. Scully. Yes, Dana Scully. I have had the opportunity to meet Mulder, but not Scully just yet. Still yeah. on the bucket I'm list. I'm more of a Mulder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, truth is out there, man. It is. Truth is out there. Um, I so want to believe. We all do. <laughs> so I went to uni straight out of school and started at forensics at UTS. They offered a, a forensic science course. Only lasted about six months and then realised that, hey, this isn't what I want to do. Education was what I wanted to do. So um, I dropped out. I started to do PE teaching at UCID. Mm-hmm. Um, living in Blacktown at the time, it was almost impossible That's to get to the commute. city. It was a big commute. Lasted there another six months. <laughs> um, and then I was like, you know what? I'm going to move to Canberra. I'm going to start. I'm going to join the, the Air Force. <laughs> I'm going to be a nurse in the Air Force. So I actually did a year of nursing. I did not da- know that. Did you not know no. that? Yeah. So I did a full year of nursing in Canberra. And at the end of the year, I was like, 
what am I doing? So I literally walked into the education department in Canberra and said, this is what I've done. This is what I want to do, help essentially. And the head of education turned around and said, well, this is perfect. We are literally just about to introduce a, bac a double degree, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Education. So from there, I had to only complete a few more units to cover the number of units I needed for my science degree. And then I needed to just complete the units for education. So I did my full education degree and finished my science degree in two and a half years down in Canberra mm -hmm. and then moved back home and started teaching back at my old high school. And the rest is history. I mean, obviously taught, taught for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you made a shift out of the classroom into corporate world. But hang on, before she did that, she was a very popular teacher. Um, <laughs> very popular in teacher. fact, viral teacher. Viral remember teacher. Remember that YouTube video? That is very, very true. Uh, I remember that YouTube let's do, video. Let's, I, we, we need the elephant paste, uh, the elephant toothpaste story, Kel. Go for it. To For be... those of you who don't know why <laughs> Kelly is so famous, the elephant paste uh, experiment. Mm, experiment gone wrong, according to <laughs> YouTube, yes. Um, so this is an experiment I had done every year, but I fatally did not read my bottles. So I didn't read the concentrations of the chemicals that my lab assistant gave me. Instead of 6% hydrogen peroxide, she gave me 36% hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> And if you've ever seen the video... No, well, hold on, because this is a podcast. Obviously, we're, 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 there'll be a, a video version of this, but we need to get a little bit descriptive about what the elephant toothpaste experiment is for our listeners. We've got a big listener group across Australia, across New Zealand. We're learning today. We've got a, we've got a, a, the, the Reinvent the Classroom podcast army in Sweden. We've got a loyal, <laughs> loyal following group in, in Sweden. Can you describe our, uh, our, uh, the, 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 the experiment? What, what's meant to happen and what did happen? What's meant to happen. So essentially what did happen is what's meant to happen, but it's meant to happen on a much smaller scale at a much slower rate. Um, so essentially it's a great um, experiment to demonstrate a whole range of different um, things to do with science like chemical reactions, um, decomposition, gas formation, exothermic and endothermic reactions and the use of catalysts which is where I sort of fell apart. <laughs> um, so when I was setting up the experiment you sort of it has a whole little bit of a narrative behind it to turn it into the elephant's toothpaste so a, a nice big tall glass measuring cylinder that you pour little strips of food coloring down to make the stripes that you get on on classic toothpaste and then you pour your dish dishwashing liquid in the bottom and that creates the foam a little bit of um, iodine and some hydrogen peroxide if you watch the video I take a scoop of the the potassium iodine powder out of the bottle and then proceed to just pour it straight out of the bottle and leave the spoon in the other hand still full of powder and sitting in the bottom of the measuring cylinder, as I said, was 36% hydrogen peroxide instead of 6%. So essentially... Which results in? Uh, an iodine, yellow iodine stain on the roof and on the floor of Just my like lab. Just like a gigantic a flume, yeah. A flume. A flume of foam. A flume of foam. Don't say yes. that uh, <laughs> too, too many times too quickly. Yep. So no safety glasses because I wasn't expecting it to react the way it was. Oh, they are. It was the first year that our students had iPads, so of course the whole class was filming, <laughs> mm -hmm. so there was plenty of evidence. And lots of uploads to YouTube, and there's uh, memes Tumblr, of it. And it Tumblr. made um, BuzzFeed there last year on Snapchat. Still, <laughs> wow. yeah. still going yeah, strong. Still, still doing the rounds. Wow. So, yeah. so after school thousands, fired you for doing that. It was 276,000 the last time. That was, that was, yeah, that's only the one. That's one of the, Seven one of the multiple incarnation variations Seven of it. Seven yeah. seconds of my life that Fantastic. I can still remember like it was yesterday. And that was, gosh... Would have been in 2014 again. This is like one of those videos where they, they talk to people who were memes. Yeah, well, you <laughs> yeah. were a meme. What happened to your life after that? <laughs> <laughs> That's what this episode, Reinvent Meme Learning. That's the yes. episode title here so far. Um, look, Kelly, you, you, you talked about in that experiment where the whole point was to, to have a lesson on catalysts. You, you hinted at... Uh, uh, the X Files TV show being a bit of a, a, a catalyst for our younger listeners. Um, <laughs> let's unpack X Files and and why was it so important to you? I don't know what it was that drew me to it, but um, I was actually talking about this today to a colleague. We have donuts where we just get paired randomly with other people in the company, and 
we just got started talking about our favorite TV shows and um, it was that excitement of having to wait a week for an episode to drop and oh, back in the days where yeah you you would have to sit in front of the tv and wait for your show to start and hit the record button i actually found as we were moving into our house um my box in the garage of all my old literally vhs's from the t the tv of all the old x files episodes i have boxes of memorabilia i have folders of Photo albums of magazine cutouts. And what was your, what was your favorite things. episode? Do you have a? Do you oh, have one? That one you of remember? my favorite episodes was an episode called Eve, which was about a girl with telekinesis. Right. And yeah, that was. They were always yeah, just really interesting concepts. And no matter how skeptical Scully was, she always came around when there was enough evidence to prove that it was right. So is that linked to that that scientific unpacking of whatever the phenomena was that, that really intrigued you? And, I and, think so. And I think the other thing as well is Scully was really one of the first really strong female characters in TV. Like she never really took any crap from Mulder. <laughs> like she always, even though she was the, you know, the demure female who... Um, she had the, the nickname of the thinking man's crumpet at one point because, you know, she had a bit of that sly, like hidden sex appeal. It wasn't outright, but she, she never, yeah, she never really took crap from any of the really strong male characters in the show. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I can, I can see the, the, the appeal. So you, you, you come into science, um, you've, what, where was your, where's your passion? Do you have, obviously we, we, we've talked about the, the, um, elven toothpaste but mm -hmm. was that what was the uh what was the topic that you really loved teaching or, 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 or the lesson that you just could you could replay that lesson like uh, a thousand times and, and and still enjoy it oh there's so many um hsc biology was my subject of of i guess expertise so um i taught hsc biology 10 years in a row um so i thought like i was i'd like to think by the end of it i was pretty, pretty darn good, good at it, it. <laughs> um i flipped my classroom with the uh, hsa bio as well so i created a lot of my own resources uh, because at the time a lot of those things didn't exist um flipping was very new in Do australia you unpack? Let, let, let's unpack <laughs> what flip learning is for the for the uninitiated yeah so essentially what i would do is i would create short videos that were related to the theory content for the subject simply because we just didn't have enough time in class to go through it all in as much detail as we needed to and with a HSC class you end up with a really diverse group of students so my first class that really really that, that I really flipped the whole lot from year 11 right through to year 12 I had students who achieved band sixes so the highest level um, for um, a stage six subject for the HSC right down to students who really struggled to get themselves into the high band threes, low band fours. And it wasn't until the end of the year where I asked those girls how they approached the year that the, uh, my understanding of the strength of the flipped classroom really came about because they said they could pause the videos, they could look up words that they didn't understand, they could watch it again. Whereas students just don't have the chance to do that in the face-to-face -face classroom. So the students would watch the videos at home before they came to class. They had scaffolded activities that went with the videos. So it wasn't just watch a video and make your own notes. They were really supported through the whole journey. So so the flipped classroom or the flipped learning concept, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but in, in a traditional sense of, 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 of the flow of, of, of curriculum delivery, mm -hmm. um, students come to the, to, to the lesson, you've got your, your science period, uh, you have your explicit teaching there, you're, you're going through your content, then you give the students follow-up activities that they either, either do at, at the tail end of the lesson or in study period or at home as part of homework, uh, and, then, and then they submit you know, the, 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 the homework or, mm -hmm. or, or the work that they've done. The flip learning here is is the the idea is you then the work that they do at home you've created these explicit teaching content so the the content of the subject gets done at home mm -hmm. and then in the classroom is when they do the activity and that's where you can use your expertise as as, as the teacher to actually help deep dive and, and and go on that almost that learning facilitator to unpack misconceptions and misunderstandings so you've 
reversed or you've flipped the way that the um, the content is delivered instead of it being done in class explicitly yeah. and then the activity the follow-up activity done at home the home is the explicit teaching yep. through video or other medium and then you do the activities uh, the follow-up activities in the class that's right that's pretty right that's pretty much spot on and i'd found through before i got to starting to flip the classroom i always found that students understood concepts more when they could see them when they could use their hands when they could create something based on the content so by flipping the classroom and taking that sort of chalk and talk phase out of the classroom meant that we had more time to do those hands-on things so we were able to do activities that weren't prescribed by the syllabus because there are quite a number of prescribed practical activities but by being able to bring in these extra hands-on activities it meant that the students just were able to pick up a lot more co a lot more of the theory-based concepts by being able to manipulate things and create things in the classroom space. Look, I actually channeled you uh, the other day. I was I was over in uh, Western Australia working at a, a school in Perth and I referenced you and, and I'm, I'm doing some, uh, I guess, some, some coaching with uh, just a, a smaller group of teachers that are trying to uh, change their, their their digital pedagogical practice, and I mean this whole this whole uh, episode, this whole uh, podcast concept is reinvent the classroom. Like, what can we do digitally different um, to enhance uh, student learning? And and I used you as an example, uh, and you said like you were very experienced with a, a biology classroom, HSC biology, like our, our final year. In, in this state in New South Wales, so the final year exams in biology, which is a, a very content heavy mm -hmm. uh, subject, but you made a video for every single uh, uh, bullet point, dot point of, of the syllabus. So mm -hmm. uh, in effect, your students were able to have a video backlog or, or back catalog of every single teaching point that was going to then be assessed mm -hmm. or potentially assessed yep. in their, their final examinations. and. Yep. And, and, and that, that's a game changer because suddenly students who can't study uh, or review content in a traditional sense suddenly have a, a whole other way of, of, of going through their study and, and, and enriching their learning. And some of my videos have over two or 3,000 views and there's no way in the time I taught biology I taught <laughs> two to 3,000 students. So I used to get, now the syllabus has changed a lot of the videos wouldn't necessarily come up if a student was searching for particular syllabus dot points, but there are still a lot of videos that relate to the new the new version of the syllabus, and I still get messages through my YouTube account from students thanking me for creating those right. videos and providing them on YouTube. Such a game changer, right? Why do you think more teachers aren't doing exactly that? I guess the biggest thing is the time it takes to commit to creating content, but that's not really necessary anymore. So we're talking back, I was I started flipping my classroom in 2013 and I didn't start with flipping everything. So over the years from 2013 to 2017, I was building my video library. I was building the lessons that went with the content. Um, so it is, it is a big job finding the content and, you know, working out what, what works with your students and, and what's appropriate. Um, I think the other thing as well is is so many people are comfortable with what they do and it is quite a very big change in the mm. way that you teach. Um, a lot of people are used to just sort of standing in the front of the classroom and, and doing that chalk and talk style and it is very, very different. Mm. Uh, um, actually, there's a, probably a nice little segue in there because I know obviously you've had a career change now. Mm -hmm. you're, you're no longer in the classroom. You've, you've moved on to uh, Education Perfect and mm -hmm. you work for Education Perfect. And there's quite a lot of synergy in that video flip collected uh, collection of learning that you, that you had and, and then your work uh, leading science for, for Education Perfect. Yeah, so I guess at the time, towards the end of my um my time in the classroom, I was using my content for my senior classes to flip because there weren't those resources available. But I was able to use the resources that were available in Education Perfect at the time to start training my juniors in the flipped classroom process. So I didn't have to spend the same amount of time finding or creating content because there was content available for that. And then now that I've moved to working for EP, I now look after essentially all of Australia for um, all content apart from our languages content which my amazing colleague um, Philippa looks after so I ensure that what we're doing is supporting teachers with 
wanting if they're wanting to do these different pedagogical approaches so the content that we create is curriculum aligned um, including the new Australian curriculum version 9 uh, it's um, highly scaffolded so the teachers can be confident in that if, if they were to give the work for the students to do independently they can work through it at their own pace there's a huge amount of data that the teacher gets to see how the students are coping with that work as well. So the teacher can then use that data. It was very different when I flipped my classroom. There was still quite a bit of manual assessment of the students to make sure that they were still understanding what they were doing in the, the pre-work, we called it. Um, whereas with a platform like Education Perfect, there's um, a huge amount of data that the teacher can extract on um, accuracy of answering questions, how long the students spent on the lesson, um, and there's a really amazing assessment tool which also highlights strengths and weaknesses for both the teacher and the student and gives mm. both um, really nice indications of where to, to go next. So you, you're talking about that, that evolution of teaching practice, evolution of, of pedagogical practice, obviously uh, very heavy uh, in, in, in giving teachers access to data that they, that they didn't previously have. If we're to like project forward and, and, and start looking at, well, what would a teacher, in your case, uh, what, would, what does a science teacher who's utilizing a lot of these platforms and, 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 and keen to explore, what could they be doing? What should they be doing to keep in sync with like curriculum changes, keep in sync with uh, needs of, of teachers, uh, of, of, of their students? What could they do? And, and, and I guess, what are you doing? And whether that's you, Kelly, uh, or, or Education Perfect, or us as a collective uh, education industry? Yeah, I think I think the big thing that we're seeing a lot more of is um, is data identified and data driven practice. Um, we see that in corporate as well. So as a, as you know, working at Education Perfect, everything that we do, I need to show the data as to why we might go with a particular project versus something else. Um, very different in a in a teacher's um, situation, they need the data to ensure that their students are heading in the right direction. Um, we're hearing a lot about sort of um, leaderboards with schools and NAPLAN especially is the big the big sort of the my school website and judging schools based on their NAPLAN results and if teachers aren't given the tools to be able to support their students and identify early where their students need support then they're really sending their students out into the wilderness with mm. a hanky full of Rocks. And, and, and actually, it's, it's funny that, that, again, I just loop back to the whole concept of reinvent the classroom and, and, and this collaboration with Intel and HP. It, it really is how do we collect data? How do we measure impact? But how do we let that data guide us to, to improve the, the, the learning outcomes of, that, that, that students receive? And, and technology can be uh, a very, very powerful tool at, at enhancing accessibility for students with um, different learning needs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being able to, to push and challenge students at, at, at their point of need and, and, and advance them and, and, and find the students who maybe have a, a misunderstanding or, or, or not getting something and not leaving it too late. And I guess that's what you say when you, when you talk about the, the my school data or the old NAPLAN data, immensely controversial because you're looking at one very quick short snapshot of student performance with a, a few years apart and, and judging in an entire school and I mean then there's big questions about is a school more than literacy and numeracy uh, assessments is a concept of education broader than than just how you go at a, at, a, at a literacy test but beyond that like it's already when when a, when a child gets that sort of score you're no longer actually able to help them. That, that's that's at the ending of the yeah, process. That's right. so getting that data early in that, that cycle of learning allows the teacher to learn where, what, what the student does and does not understand and mm -hmm. then intervene where appropriately. 100%. And I think that's where teachers can really leverage the power of technology, whether it's a tool like EP or whether it's any other tool that allows a teacher to input student performance and be able to track that over time be able to identify those areas of weakness and those areas of strength, as you said. So we can be not only looking at bringing up the students who are lagging a little bit behind up with the rest of them, but also not forgetting those kids who yeah. need that little bit more um, push in order to really show their true potential. Because sometimes in a classroom of 30 kids, you can have 
as I, as I mentioned with my biology class, that was just a very small sample size. That was only a group of 18 girls. But still within that group, mm. I had such a diverse um, group of abilities. But then you look into the junior years and, and into the primary school level where you've got sometimes up to 32 students in a class. And being able to cater for all of them is just becoming harder and harder. And the record keeping is becoming more and more mm. demanding on teachers' time. And being able to leverage a tool like EP or, as I said, any other tool that allows teachers to carry out regular formative assessment and track that data is just going to take that extra pressure off the teacher to be able to then come back to that, what we were talking about before with the flipped classroom and yeah. be able to put time into those fun things that get the kids excited and engaged and wanting them to come to your class. Ha having the right tool and, 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 and leveraging the right tool is, is, is just so valuable. Um, Rob, as, as a massive tool yourself, <laughs> <laughs> what's up? <laughs> I've been sitting on that joke for, for about the, the last five minutes. As a massive tool, Rob, like what are the, the, the future uh, trends in education? I'm not answering that. <laughs> No, but in, in, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, no, we, we, our origin story was coming together to, to, to learn uh, from each other, to, to learn shared practice. Reinvent the Classroom is all about how do we improve uh, teacher di digital pedagogical, digi digital uh, practice. We, we met at a teach meet. Like uh, COVID really changed the game in, in how we can learn what tools uh, everyone else is using, what what is working at, at, at this school, what, what's happening over the border there. Like, what's your take on, on, on what's that happened? Twitter chats, um, teach meets, like, are they happening? What's replaced them? Where are we going? Well, you know, there are still people doing what, what we've always done, and that's collaborate online. Um, and we were collaborating quite a lot in person. It's still happening through conferences and teach meets and that sort of thing. But I feel like there's been quite a bit of a decline in the whole, mm. for instance, the teach meet movement. That was a really grassroots sort of movement mm. where we would get together in, in whether it be um, a school somewhere or a hall or a pub. And, you know, just talk about what we're doing in our own classrooms, share the practice, share some of the tools we use. And, um, yeah, it's really backed off, I feel like, in, in the last however many years i was gonna say a big big shout out to you and mcintosh the, the 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 father of uh the granddaddy of 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 the whole teach mm. meet movement you're right started in a pub just teachers getting together uh sharing sharing a, a pint sharing a milkshake and, and and saying what they're doing what they're learning and and, and what's working mm -hmm. and that's where we met but um yeah what do you think has driven that i, I don't know why, why is it backed off i really know. I, I really wish that they'd come back because they were great like conferences from an EP perspective, we've found that conferences have really pulled back as well because um, teacher shortages is the first problem. Mm -hmm. So getting coverage for those teachers who want to go to an all-day conference is quite hard. Whereas teach meets, they were always after hours. They were only short. They were a couple of hours. And then you had the, the teach eat where we would go and, and do what we did and have a, share a meal and then the conversation would continue. And I, I really think the Teach Meet movement needs to come back because it was... That'd be fantastic. It was yeah. great. Quick five minutes from each person. If you didn't like it, you switched off for five minutes, you came back for the next person. Mm. Unlike a conference where you sit and you walk into an hour session that you've been totally misled by the by the, um, the, that, by the the abstract for the presentation and you're stuck there for an hour. Yeah. How, how about, look, we are in a mecca of uh, technological revolution here at the, the, the HP office. What about, I, I can see Joel over over at the far side, Joel. What do you reckon? Uh, we, we put together a little bit of a teach meet here and we, we kind of see if we can't rekindle that magic reinvent and, the and, and reinvent the teach <laughs> meet and, and have a gathering of teachers and share practice and do what we used to do and, 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 and just see there because there is there was something magical about that. It's I, definitely a gateway to sharing your practice. It and is. It, it meant for me that I was more happy to share my practice within my school and, you know, local schools, that sort of thing. As I that. said, it changed, it literally changed my life, that mm. first teach meet. Having... Um, signing up for it, I remember practicing <laughs> my presentation for that teach meet and then walking into Google, like we were all just mesmerized about the fact that we were in the Google headquarters yeah. and, um, and then walking out of it with 
literally friends for life. Friendships, friends for life. Well. And then the, the, the birth of, or the, 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 the transition of, of Aussie Ed, the, the, which at its heyday was the, the largest online network of, of teachers in Australia. What had just been me like waving my own little flag that evening turned into a, a, a group of passionate educators uh, redesigning and, and, and reshaping a way to collaborate online uh, mm-hmm. and, and do things that were, were previously like unimaginable. Mm-hmm. But um, look, I, th- I think COVID did change a lot of things. Like we are, teachers are under a lot of stress. Our teachers are very, very time poor. Teacher, teachers are digitally fatigued. There's been so much change happened lately. Yeah. Like without, without, um, a lot of our uh, our guests, you know, we, we bring up the, the the idea of AI and and, and the different shift of of change and, and and the rate of change and change fatigue is a Not is a real that, thing. Right? I mean, you, you've talked about curating good quality content and also creating good quality content. Our assumption was, I think, or certainly was for me, we get YouTube, we have the internet everyone's bandwidth increases and then there's just so much information out there that great now we can learn from all of that information Mm. turns out you have to find the good quality Mm -hmm. information and it's not necessarily easier just because there's more More, do you have any advice like as somebody that spends so much time thinking about what makes good quality content for learners how does a teacher curate the good stuff when there's just it's it's like putting your mouth over a a fire hydrant sometimes (laughs) um that's a really good question i guess there are a lot of reputable tools out there that are already doing that heavy lifting for you but of course like ep a lot of them do come usually with some kind of subscription fee that has to be outlaid so if a school is in a not in a situation where they don't have the ability to pay for a platform and they do need to go down the route of finding their own resources. I think using a, a platform like Twitter or even Facebook groups now, I've noticed that Facebook groups have also started to become quite a, a large community of practice as well. So um, again, going back to um, while I was still teaching, I did my master's and one of my units was social networking for educators. And we had to Id- identify an area of need and create a social network off the back of that. And so at that time, the New South Wales biology syllabus was changing and teachers were freaking out. So I created the New South Wales biology teachers Facebook group, which now sits at just over three and a half thousand wow, teachers. Congrats. And so similar teachers are just constantly sharing resources in that group or asking for recommendations. So I think getting on to something like that doesn't cost anything. It's going to save you going out and just typing into Google, show me something Rob, to do teach you need, this. You've, you're you're our, um, our, our hardware, software uh, specialist. Um, do we need to you start You just called me teach, a tool now. Teach, um. do, we need to start, do we need to start teach talk? Teach talk. That's a good, that's a very catchy. I hope you've already trademarked that before you put it out there in the wild. Yeah, before this, this goes live, copy, copyright pending for uh, <laughs> Salakas Industries. But uh, look, but you're right, meeting people where they're at, like uh, the, the platform they're at. And, and that's why I think it's been a little bit hard because the, the, the expectation on teachers' time has increased you know, exponentially mm-hmm. during COVID mm-hmm. that hasn't backed off in a post-COVID uh, time. Uh, globally, there is a teacher shortage uh, on top of the fact that, 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 that the expectations on teachers have risen so dramatically lately. So it needs, to, this professional development needs to be done um, differently to mm-hmm. how we have done it in the past. And, and that's why it, it's it's so important to, um, I guess, keep up with the times. I guess in a, in a lovely way to finish, and, and I, I think we should uh, commit to let, let's let's do something a little bit awesome but in a lovely way to finish Kel if you you had a young teacher or an experienced teacher someone who wants to change their practice wants to do something uh, a, a little bit different wants to push themselves challenge themselves pedagogically um, what would you what, what advice would you give to that person uh, that, that wants to step into that, that 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 digital realm to better support their students I think just exactly what I just said, get yourself on social networking, find yourself a, a PLN and PL professional N? learning network, professional, professional learning community, whichever PLN, PLC. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, just a digital professional learning network either. If you look on um, things like Eventbrite, you can find free education events that are mm. happening in your area. 
and just start to build a community that you can you can share off like we've yeah. seen the power of the people in what we've done in we the are last. stronger together we are and you know i i was the rogue high school teacher in our in our little group and but i learned so much from you guys in how to engage students and how to build that excitement in the classroom and um, how to incorporate a range of different strategies in the one lesson and um, I think there's so much that teach anybody whether you you're walking out of university next week as a new grad or you've been in the game for 20 years I think everybody can still learn something from everybody else yeah that's brilliant yeah what a great way to finish. Let's, let's learn from each other. Let's sharpen up uh, our, our ability to, to support students and, and let's make uh, learning fun again. Uh, just make sure you check the, uh, the the levels before you try and do an <laughs> elephant toothpaste experiment. That's correct, yes. There Always check your labels. <laughs> thanks so much for joining thanks, us. Kelly. Uh, Kel. No, thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Great episode. Great episode, Kelly. Thanks so much for, for, for coming here uh, today. Uh, look, there is one more thing that I did want to ask you about. We've just spoken about uh, how teachers can, can learn from each other and, and sharpen their practice. You've been working on a book, is that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> ah, and your working title? is uh, very bad at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> from meh to amazing? That's that's the very loose working title at the moment, yes. <laughs> tell, tell me about your book. So essentially, it's just I, my goal for the book is for as I said, either a new teacher who's just walked out of university or a teacher that's been in the game for a while looking to change things up a little bit just to pick it up and have a range of different ideas and tools that they can they can use to change the way that they approach science teaching. So it's, I, it's probably nothing revolutionary, but it's all in one place. It's broken up into sections of um, what to do when you're teaching in in a standard classroom versus in a laboratory classroom. Um, there's a section on creating a social group, like getting onto social media and creating a network. Um, and then just, yeah, a lot of things that I've built and gathered over my time. So again, sort of going back to what Rob said before is how do you find it? There's a whole stack of it. Read your book. That's right. <laughs> Read <laughs> Kelly's book. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. It's been fantastic. Thanks for having me. Great. <laughs>